our Wednesday night service um, as we worship the Lord because He is worthy tonight, no doubt, to be praised. And we just uh, thank you for being a part of it. So we're going to open up in a word of prayer. Um, and then we're, they're going to sing about the goodness of God. And we would uh, definitely encourage you to join in if you know that. Um, we just appreciate you uh, being a part tonight. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you tonight. And Lord, we know that, um, Lord, whether we meet in a building or whether we're in our homes, that, God, you've made us a promise that, Lord, you would be uh, present where two or three are gathered together in your name. So, Lord, we just pray, God, through anything that's sung tonight or anything that is said or done, that, uh, Lord, your name would be glorified. That, Lord, people would be pricked in their hearts through your word, and God, that decisions would be made that would uh, better people's lives. And Lord, if there's one listening tonight that doesn't know you as personal Lord and Savior, we would certainly pray, God, that, uh, that through something that would be said, God, that they would realize their need, uh, not just for a Savior, but for a Lord, someone to control their lives and to step in and uh, uh, do the things that need to be done and guide them in the right path. Lord, we're just so thankful, God, that you're uh, continually working in our hearts and our lives and our minds, and God, helping us to be more Christ-like. So, Lord, we just want to thank you for that tonight. I want to thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to share your word in song and um, the, through the Bible. And, Lord, we just pray, God, you have your way in everything that's done. Lord, we just praise you and love you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.
like the Bible says, it is the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. And praise God for that tonight. And we definitely thank the praise team um, for being faithful and uh, worshiping the Lord each time that we gather together. I'm going to ask you tonight, if you will, to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 7. Um, we have been studying in the book of Acts, talking about uh, basically the general subject of the church is on the move. Um, the fact that when God gets on the move and when he did in his church, this first church here in Jerusalem that we looked at, uh, that he wanted his people to get on the move and as they did, uh, God began, began to do some great and mighty things through them. Um, we were last week in chapter 6 and we looked at where the first deacons were chosen out or picked out and um, in more in particular, and what we're going to look at tonight is, is Stephen's life and um, some things that, some characteristics basically that Stephen possessed um, in being a man that was called by God. Uh, uh, we know him, no doubt, as uh, probably the first martyr uh, for the uh, church and its purpose. Uh, now, one of the things that we have talked about in this was there were three things that um, this first church, they had unity. Um, they were unified in their prayer. They were unified in their purpose. And they, uh, let me tell you something, every time someone would come against them, they would preach the gospel. They uh, were steadfast in that fact, and they knew where their power lied, that it lied uh, uh, in the Word of God. So I want to not uh, to look at verse, we're going to begin in verse 48, Acts chapter 7. Verse 48, and we're kindly uh, jumping in the uh, end of this, but I will go back and share just a few things with you, but uh, this is where we want to begin tonight. Acts chapter 7, verse 48. The scripture reads, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me? saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, do ye always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did? So do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the dis disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down, Stephen kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now what I want to talk to you about tonight in the subject of the uh, message for tonight is the object of my obsession. The object of my obsession. The word obsession, if you look it up in the dictionary, and I know there's many different dictionaries around, but um, in, in what I was looking at, this was the uh, definition. It said, obsession was an idea or thought that continually preoccupies a person's mind. To be totally fixated on something or someone. Now we know in the world that we live in today, people get obsessed with many things. A lot of people are obsessed with money. Many people are obsessed with their uh, careers and jobs, many people even obsessed with their families and, um, you know, providing for their families and things like that. 
There's just so many things. Uh, other people are obsessed, you know, maybe with their spouse. Or maybe uh, you, like I, when I was a teenager, was obsessed with my what is my wife now. Uh, but, you know, we would sit on the phone for hours just listening to each other breathe and those type of things. And You, wo- you woke up in the morning uh, thinking about something and you... Uh, you know, went to bed at night thinking about something. And that's just a, a very simple definition of being obsessed with something. Now, in this scripture that we have uh, dove into the end of here tonight in chapter 7, you'll see that through this that Stephen was being persecuted. If you were to go back and uh, read uh, some of this, and, and you could go back into uh, chapter 6 when they... Uh, chose Stephen out, said he was full of faith and power and he did great wonders and miracles among the people. Well, no doubt the religious people of that day didn't like that. They were, they first of all didn't understand this new, uh, this gospel that was going around about a man named Jesus who was the son of God who, uh, you know, who uh, died on a, who they crucified, but uh, thinking that that was the end of him, but the fact that he rose again the third day and to give them life. And now they were out preaching this new new word, this new gospel, and just people weren't taking it well, especially the religious people of that day. And so uh, verse 12 of chapter 6 said, It stirred up the people, that it stirred up the people and the scribes and the elders, and they came upon him and called him and brought him to counsel or brought him to trial. And they were going to try Stephen for the things that he was speaking. And if you go back into this, just as I had said earlier, what you will see that as they uh, brought Stephen into trial, what he did is he began to preach to them. He began to tell them the story. He began to he even went all the way back to Abraham. And if you go and you look, and I'm just going to give you a brief rundown of this scripture and give you some verses. Uh, that you can look at later. But if you look at verses 2 through 8 of chapter 7, what you'll see there is he begins talking about Abraham, and in that he talks about his calling. How in uh, Genesis chapter 12, how that God had called Abraham to go to a land that God would show him. And no doubt that would take great faith. God said, you know, you get your family together, you say goodbye to Uh, uh, those around you and get your family and you go and I'll show you where to go. In that scripture in verses uh, 2 through 8 through there he also begins to talk about uh, uh, the promise that he had made to Abraham. The fact that he would give him a child and that scripture talks about how that he begot Isaac. How that Isaac was the promised seed and that God fulfilled his promise in Abraham because Abraham was obedient to what God had called him to do. It also talks about in there and mentions in those verses the the covenant of circumcision and how that in those days that was an outward sign of an inward relationship that they had with God. So it's much powerful scripture and and Stephen was using all of this uh, because the law, the Old Testament and the Old Testament covenants is what they lived their life by. You can go on and you can look at verses 9 through 19 and he begins to talk about Joseph. And he talks about in that how that Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. And we are, you may know that story somewhat and how he was sold in eventually into Potiphar's house and how uh, that God also made Joseph a promise that as long as he would be obedient to the Lord and God fulfilled that promise by promoting him all throughout um, the nation, throughout that kingdom as they were there in Egypt. Now, also in that, When you look at those verses in 9 through 19, you'll also see that there is a dilemma there because the scripture says that a king came along that did not know Joseph. And that they began to to persecute the nation of Israel. And we know that they 
uh, wound up in slavery, you know, for 400 and about 35, 438 years or so. And I think he is also, I think Stephen is also referring back to that to remind the people that God had made them some promises. And as long as they would be obedient, as long as they would pay attention to their relationship uh, to God, to the Lord, that God would bless them and God would keep them free. But the minute that they would turn their backs on God, that God would allow them to become slaves. Slaves of the world. Slaves of, even slaves of religion. You can go on into the next part of that scripture and uh, which covers a lot of verses, verses 20 through 43, and he begins to talk about Moses. And he begins to talk about how even though they were in slavery, that God had called a man. It starts all the way from Moses' birth. And how that he eventually, you know, wind up in Pharaoh's house, and through that, that God called him, you know, uh, God called him at the burning bush, and God called him uh, to, to deliver the people. Moses, no doubt, was a great leader. Yes, he made mistakes, and yes, he didn't even uh, get to uh, enter into the promised land, but God did some great works through Moses. We still talk about him today. And then he ends up that group of scripture in verses 20 through 43 by talking about the rebellious people of Israel. And if we know about that, we know that, um, you know, no man over 20 years old that began that, that began that journey was able to enter into the promised land. And then he talks about, and I want to read this, verse 44 through 47. And he talks about, he says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Now the tabernacle in the Old Testament, the tabernacle that, that this scripture is talking about, was a place where God would meet with Moses. It's a place where God said His presence. If Moses wanted to find Him, he could always find Him in the tabernacle. They would carry it along throughout their wilderness journey. And whenever they set up camp, they would set up the tabernacle. Why? Because that represented the presence of God. And they, no matter oh, if they were living in obedience or no matter if they had got caught up in sin, they realized that God was a good God and that God was a powerful God and they wanted to keep Him as close as possible even when they wasn't doing right. Now, verse 45 says, Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our father unto the days of David. That scripture and what Stephen is saying there in the days of Moses, God made a way. God made a way of escape. And that way of escape was through the leadership of Moses. He's saying, but now God has made a different way. God has made a way through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he even talks about in uh, some of the scripture how that, uh, you know, he talks about in verse 52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? They have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, talking about the coming of Christ. So he's telling them that Jesus had made the way. And then in verse 46 he refers back, who found favor before God and desired, uh, he's talking about David, until the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. Talking about Solomon built the temple. David wanted to build the temple. But as we know, God said that David had shed too much blood, so his son Solomon wound up building the temple. But where we began was in verse 48 tonight. And he says, But how be it the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, 
as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? Now I want to go back to the subject or the of tonight's message, the object of my obsession. See, I believe that Stephen, this man chosen of God, this man that was willing to die for his faith, was willing to be stoned to death for what he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he was, and we can see through this scripture that he was obsessed with history, right? He went right back to history. He knew that they knew history, and he began to share that history, but even more so important than the fact that he was obsessed with history, he was obsessed with his story. The story of Jesus Christ. He had an understanding that all the things throughout the Old Testament and all the things that the nation of Israel went through was to lead them in a path that would eventually lead to the Lord Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross, but also the fact that he would raise again from the dead on the third day to prove that he was the Son of God, but also to give the world newness of life, to show the world the way. See, I think Stephen was obsessed with this new way. This new way to God. See, to the, uh, to the scribes, to the Pharisees, to the religious people of this day, the very people that were persecuting Stephen, see, their way to God has always been, up until this point, till hearing this new way, had, it, their old way had always been, well, if I follow the law closely, how good I am at keeping the law determines my relationship uh, with God. That is the way, that's all they had ever heard. They had spent many years being educated uh, concerning those facts. And now here comes Stephen and, and, and uh, you know, men even before him as, as uh, Peter and John and uh, the disciples were preaching about uh, this Jesus Christ that died on the cross and the fact that he was the Son of God and that he was raised from the dead and all these things. They were having a hard time grabbing a hold of that. But Stephen, he was obsessed with it. I think he had to be obsessed with it in order to die for it. See, he, like the church, I believe that he was continually prayed. I believe that he continually preached. And I believe that he continually pursued people and pursued his relationship with God. I want to show you quickly three things out of this scripture that really stuck out to me in these verses that we read tonight concerning Stephen. You know, when I think about being obsessed with something, I think about where our world is right now today. You can't turn on the TV without hearing about the coronavirus and all that kind of stuff. It's like our world is obsessed with this sickness. Now, I don't want you to take that the wrong way because I realize it's serious. I realize, you know, we should do everything we can to uh, be safe and to protect uh, those that we love and the world around us. But I also know the more attention that you give something like this, the less attention you're going to give the God of this world. And I'm talking about the big G God. I'm talking about the God who created the heavens and the earth. See, when we allow our problems uh, to become, or let's say it like this, when we allow our fear to become bigger than our faith, we have stepped outside of the realm of being pleasing unto God. What if we, let me ask this question, what if we paid as much attention to the sickness of sin as we pay to this sickness called the coronavirus or COVID-19? What if we were worried so uh, much about catching worldliness as we are catching 
this sickness. I think the, no doubt, the media has become obsessed with it and unfortunately I think probably a lot of God's people has become obsessed with it. But folks, can I dare say that we should all do as, as Stephen did, especially in a time like this, and look what the scripture says um, in verse 55. Well, let's back up to 54 first of all. It says when these people, when these re religious people, when the leaders heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And that they gnashed on him with their teeth. You know, this is about, as we in this seventh chapter here, this is about the third or fourth time that we read about where that either the people were pricked in their heart. You know, every time that they began, when Peter began to preach at Pentecost, that's what the scripture says, that the people were pricked in their heart. Here it says that uh, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. See, because that was the working, that was the moving of the Holy Spirit of God, that uh, because man was doing his part, because Stephen was doing his part, God was totally fulfilling His promise and doing His part. And they had a decision to make. And folks, let me say to you uh, tonight, we all, every day when we wake up, we've got a decision to make in our life. We're going to decide, am I going to let my fear get the best of me today, or am I going to let my faith determine my path for this day? Am I going to uh, focus all my time, all my attention on uh, the fact that, uh, you know, on this sickness or on uh, what could happen and all those things? How about we turn our focus on what already has happened on a hill called Calvary? That we place our attention on the fact that, that, as the Scripture says, that by His wounds, because of what Christ did on that old rugged cross, that we can be healed, folks. That's not just physically, that is more so even spiritually, that we can be healed. We can have, as the Scripture says, joy that remains. We can have uh, that peace that is unspeakable. We can have peace that passeth all understanding. All those good things that the Scripture says. And let me tell you, my Bible says that there's no weapon formed against us as Christians that can prosper. Because of who Jesus is, if we will just not look at Him as our Savior, but if we will recognize Him as our Lord. And we will say, Lord, you're in control of this day. Lord, you created this day. This is your day. And Lord, I'm going to live my life in faith and trust. And, and I'm going to live my life today under the power of the resurrection. It says they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. They made a bad decision. But verse 55 says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, what did he do? He looked up. Folks, that's what we need to do. We need to look up. Instead of looking around us, because let me tell you something, there is a mess going on around us, and it ain't just this sickness. Uh, folks, let me tell you something, many people are getting over this sickness, but there's only one way to get over the sickness of sin. And that's through what Jesus did on the cross. That's through allowing Him to become Lord of your life. That's through giving our hearts and our lives totally over to Him. The Scripture says He looked up. And when He looked up, you know what He saw? He saw Him. He saw Jesus. Verse 56 says that, and He said, it said but the Verse 55, but he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He looked. And when he looked, he saw. The scripture tells me that if we will uh, uh, if we will knock, that he will answer. 
that if we seek him, Jesus said, we'll find him. Look, Stephen wasn't looking for relief. Stephen wasn't looking for comfort. Stephen wasn't looking to get out of his situation. Stephen was looking for Jesus. And when he knew where to look, and when he looked up, he saw him. And he saw him in a personal way. And I say that because I like how he referred to him. Uh, let me just read that again. It says that, uh, he says, and, and said, verse 56, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. This was an intimate reference to who Jesus Christ was. He didn't call him the Son of God, he called him the Son of Man. He recognized not only was he 100% God, but he was also 100% man, and he saw the humanity in Christ. He knew the fact that it was a, not only God that hung on that cross, but it was a man that was willing to give his life. And folks, I think that we could back that up by the fact that he followed in the Lord's footsteps when they stoned him and said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Remember as Jesus hung there and he said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, I think that the reason that we, in all of these cases that Stephen had preached back, all the way back to Abraham and Moses and David and Joseph and through all that Old Testament teaching that he just gave them, he was letting these people know that the reason they made the mistakes, the reason they fell away from God was because of ignorance. But one was here now to teach them, and that was the Holy Ghost who the Bible says would bring all things to, re to their remembrance and teach them all things. And he was saying, I am full of the Holy Ghost, and as I look into heaven, I see the Lord Jesus Christ that died for not only my sins but died for yours too he saw him in a personal way, intimate way but he also saw him in his glory and in his majesty he saw him for who he truly was that he was standing at the right hand of God See, he also saw him in his rightful place. And folks, that is the need of our world today. Is to see Christ in his rightful place. Not as this world will tell you that there's many ways to God, that you can uh, approach God in many different ways. Let me say, there is only one way tonight, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man will come to the Father except by Him. He is the only way. He put Him in His rightful place, not just wanted Him to be His Savior, not just wanting him, uh, uh, wanting a cross to save him from hell, but he wanted to put him as Lord of his life. He, he did put him as Lord of his life and let him rule and reign throughout his time until God said it's time to bring him home. So he looked. He looked up in verse 55. And he saw... In verse 56, he saw God. He saw Christ. Saw Him personally, intimately. Saw Him in His glory and His majesty. And saw Him in His rightful place. But also in verse 60, it says, And He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And I like this part. It doesn't say and when he had said this, he died, does it? It says when he said this, he fell asleep. He rested. Isn't that what we do at night when we lay our head in, on a pillow, when we lay in the bed at night? We're not dying. We're just resting. Why? Because we're going to get up in the morning. Let me tell you something, Stephen had an understanding, I believe, and, and not only that, but Luke who wrote this had an understanding of the fact 
that when to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. He knew that he might have went to sleep here on earth. He might have been went to sleep being stoned to death. But let me tell you something. In an instant, he was woke up, and he was woke up in heaven with the Lord. Church, I'm telling you, if the Christian community needs something, we, we need it all the time, but we uh, desperately need it right now, no doubt, and the world needs it right now. We need rest. We need to rest in our relationship with the Lord. He rested in His relationship. He didn't lay there and struggle about what His destiny would be. He didn't lay there at night and wonder uh, if He really got it or if He didn't, if He was saved or if He wasn't or if He would make it to heaven or if He wouldn't. He rested in His relationship with the Lord. That's why Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest unto your souls. He says, Take my yoke upon you because my burden is easy, or my burden is, is easy and my load is light, and all those things that he said. Let me tell you something. He rested in his relationship. He rested in the promises that God had made him uh, throughout the Old Testament which he understood led him uh, to what happened on Calvary and led him to what happened when Christ rose the third day. What did Jesus say in John 14 where he was talking to his disciples? He said, uh, uh, do not fear, or, or I know this is not the exact word, but he said, don't be afraid. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Why? Because he was the only way. Later on in that scripture, he says, and you know the way. And of course, they said, Thomas said, Lord, we don't know the way. And that's when he said, I am the way. Folks, when we can rest in our relationship with the Lord, we don't have to wonder what the way is. We'll know that He is the only way. Not only the only way to heaven, church, what I'm talking about is our only way to find peace, our only way to find joy, our only way to find satisfaction in life. This world has nothing to offer. He rested in Christ. You know, we talk about, when we talk about salvation, and especially when we talk about people's lack of salvation, the fact that people haven't given their lives over to the Lord and allowed Jesus to be Lord of their life. We talk about being separated from God eternally. See, that is exactly, no doubt, what hell is, is being, yes, it's the, it's the uh, you know, the, the fire and, and uh, eternal pain and eat burning eternally and all of that. I believe that's literal in the Scripture. But folks, the worst part of hell is going to be being separated from God eternally. That's going, to be the, that's going to be the hardest part of it. But see here, Stephen rested because he knew he was going to be separated from the world eternally. Have you ever thought about it that way? No more sickness, no more pain, no more suffering. The scripture says no more tears. Think about all the, no more uh, COVID-19, no more uh, cancer, no more divorce, no more bills, amen? No more any of that, folks. Let me tell you, heaven definitely has its rewards, but we, as the children of God, if we'll get a hold of a life like Stephen, we can begin to enjoy the reward right here where we're at. He rested in Christ. Folks, if we could just, if the church of today could just rest in Christ. The 
if we didn't allow so many opinions and attitudes and all those things that creep into our churches regularly because no church is exempt from that. And if we could just rest in the fact that this place was built for him, not for any of us. He said in that scripture that we read when he talked about Solomon building the temple, it says, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. What he's saying there and what I'm saying to you uh, tonight is that if you know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. And whether you're at home, whether you're in the grocery store, whether you're in the hospital, where, no, even if you're in this house, let me tell you something, you carry everything, you carry the one inside of you that can give you peace in your life. It's not this building. It's the God of this building. And the only way through to Him is through Jesus. When we put Jesus in His rightful place, you know what happens? We learn how to love Him. We learn how to adore Him. We learn how to be obsessed with Him. See, not only was Stephen obsessed with Jesus, I believe, but Jesus was also obsessed with Stephen. And I'll say he was obsessed with you too. That's why he was willing to go hang on a cross for your sins and mine. That's why he was willing to pay a price that he didn't owe. That's why he was willing to step in our place to be our substitute even though we were guilty, he was so willing. Let me tell you, Jesus is obsessed with you. I think about, and you can think about your, let's start with your life before knowing Christ, if you're listening tonight and you are a Christian. And think about all the times that maybe you ignored him. Maybe all the times that you sat in a church service and there was someone preaching or someone singing and the Holy Spirit of God dealing with your heart and you rejected him time after time after time. You know why he didn't give up? Because he was obsessed with you. He wanted you that bad that he didn't give up. You may be here or be listening tonight and you may not know Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Maybe He's been dealing with your heart. Maybe you haven't softened your heart enough or allowed Him to soften your heart enough to hear His voice yet. But can I say that uh, you can read in Psalm 136, the Scripture says repeatedly that His mercy endures forever. You know why His mercy endures forever in your life? Because he's obsessed with you. He paid it all just for you. But I'll say this in closing. And I'll go back to what Stephen was teaching these men or preaching to these men, these leaders of the law these leaders of the Old Testament way, he was preaching a new way. Maybe you need to find a new way tonight. Maybe you, in Psalm 107, I like how the scripture talks about that the, the writer there said that he was at the end of his rope. That he was staggering around like a drunken man. Let me say, maybe your life is in turmoil. Maybe your life is full of fear and full of doubt and full of pride. 
And I'm by no means telling you tonight that if you uh, receive Jesus into your heart and put your faith and trust in him that all your problems are going to go away. But I will say this, your biggest problem will go away and that's your sin condition. It's worse than any virus. It's worse than any disease. Why? Because it will separate you from God eternally. But there's a new way. And that new way is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you need peace in your life, Jesus Christ is the answer. If you need hope, if you need to get rid of that baggage, get rid of that shame, get rid of that discouragement, Jesus is the way. He is the truth. And He is the way to a new life. And we would invite you to come to Him tonight. They're going to come up and sing, and they're going to sing a, call, a song um, that you may be familiar with that is, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Christian, I would say to you that if Jesus has broken the chains in your life, you ought to worship Him tonight. You ought to praise Him. You ought to thank God that He has protected you, that He has empowered you, that He has allowed you to live this life that you live. And hopefully you live it by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. But if you're here tonight and you're lost as they sing this song, it talks about breaking those chains in your life and setting you free. Let me tell you something. If Jesus the Son frees you, you'll be free indeed. You speak to the Lord and allow him to speak to you tonight.
We thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, remember us in prayer. I uh, appreciate you uh, just listening to Union Grove Baptist Church, 395 Bander Road in Salemburg. Um, when all this settles down, you come uh, worship with us. We'd love to have you, and uh, we'll lift the name of Jesus up high together. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer, and hope you all have a great day and tomorrow, and uh, just a, be ready to come back ready to worship Him Sunday. Um, you can access all of our stuff on uh, uniongrovebc.net. So we just uh, thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the opportunity that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for your presence tonight. Uh, Lord, we know no doubt that your word doesn't come back void. Uh, Lord, it accomplishes what you have set it out to do. Lord, we know, uh, Lord, that not only does it save, but it separates oftentimes. But, uh, God, we just pray, God, that you do the work. Lord, we uh, feel like we tried to do our part. We did it the best that we could. Uh, Lord, and we feel like you empowered it, that you was behind it. Uh, so, God, even if we don't hear of the results, God, we know that you're working. And we are just so thankful for that. Lord, we love you tonight. Thank you for the salvation that is found through Christ Jesus and the finished work of the cross. Thank you, Lord, for the newness of life and the joy that's in us because of the resurrection. And we just praise you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.